For reference, I'm a 20-year-old male who weighs about 200 pounds. I live in a suburban area of a very large city, which I won't disclose here. If I did, it would make it extremely easy to figure out where I live, based on context clues. This experience happened to me about two weeks ago, and I'm still real shaken up from it. I worked as a busboy on the weekends at a popular catering home near where I lived. I've been working there for a little over a month now. It was actually my last day, since I had another job lined up that was offering me more hours, with better pay as well. All I had to do was be available to work on weekends. I had to work a party that lasted from 7pm until midnight, and I had to stay for almost two hours after it ended too, to reset the room for the following morning. At around 2 o'clock or so, we'd finished up resetting the room, and were told we could finally leave. I was about to walk out the building, when my boss suddenly ran over to me and asked if I could help her move a table to the upstairs room. I didn't mind, so I agreed. We placed the table where it needed to go, and then we both went back downstairs. As we walked outside, we said goodnight to each other, as she got into her Uber that she'd requested to take her home. Now, due to numerous setbacks in my life, I unfortunately do not have my driver's license. The catering hall is about a 30 to 40 minute walk away from my house, and I didn't mind walking that far. During my time working there, my parents had been nice enough to drive me to and from work. My mom had told me to call her when I got off, as usual, and she would give me a lift home. She didn't want me walking by myself that late at night. Well, I gave her a call on her phone, and immediately it went to voicemail, indicating her phone was off. I tried again, and the same thing happened. I thought to myself that she must have fallen asleep while waiting and forgot to put her phone on the charger again. It must have died. I called my dad hoping his phone was not silent as it usually was when he goes to sleep. As my luck would have it, it must have been since I called his phone a fair few times and got no answer. Well, fuck, I thought to myself. All my co-workers had already left and I couldn't ask anyone I worked with for a ride home. The only bus nearby that would cut my trip in half stopped running at midnight, so I couldn't take the bus now either. I also didn't call an Uber. I'd forgotten my debit card at home. I only had two singles on me. Needless to say, it looked like I was going to have to walk home. To give you some perspective, the catering hall was located in between a service road that runs along a major highway and a street that rides along the coast. In order to get home, I had to walk down the service road for about 10 minutes until I hit the aforementioned Coast Side Road, which went underneath the highway. Then I would have to walk two more blocks up that road until I hit another street. Then I had to turn right, walk for another 10 minutes, half of which was spent walking uphill, until I reached the street that entered the community I lived in. I began the tiring walk, and about five minutes later, I'd passed the bar. I saw a car idling in the parking lot, with only the left headlight shining. The car was a white Toyota Camry. That's if I'm not mistaken. I'm not an expert on cars. There were two guys in the car smoking a cigarette. I quickly glanced over while passing by. I didn't really think much of what I saw. The bar closed at 1 in the morning, but I figured these guys had just pulled into the lot for a quick smoke while driving. I turned onto the road that runs underneath the highway and was crossing the service road on the other side when I suddenly got the urge to look behind me. I quickly looked back to see the same car driving down the road I was walking along. It wasn't exactly pitch black, but it was still relatively dark enough to where I might not have even recognized the car if both headlights had been shining. I continued walking and eventually turned right onto the road with the hill I mentioned earlier. They slowed down next to me, and the passenger rolled down the window to say something to me. The road I had turned onto was even darker than the road I was walking on before, so I wasn't able to make out what either of the people in the car looked like. 
From what I could make out, they were both probably in their late 20s and wearing dark, concealing clothing. The driver appeared to be a white male, and the passenger looked like a black guy. The passenger called out to me, Hey, what are you doing walking so late at night? I responded that I was walking home from work. He then asked me if I would like them to give me a ride home. I responded by saying that was very kind of them, but I was fine walking by myself. Thank you for the offer, though. The man got visibly annoyed and appeared to be somewhat agitated. Nah, man, it's dark and dangerous out here. You should let us give you a ride home. We'll get you there safe and sound. Come on, you can trust us. At this point, the only things on the road were the car and myself. I declined once again and darted behind the car to walk across the street. I walked up and turned left into the parking lot of a different community. It was about two blocks away from my own. It had a chain in front of it preventing people without a proper key from parking inside. All of a sudden, the driver rolled down the window. Get the fuck back here, you little shit! He did a U-turn and pulled up to the entrance of the lot. The passenger jumped out and began to chase me on foot. The driver peeled off after, presumably to get onto the road on the other side and try to ambush me. Needless to say, my adrenaline immediately started spiking. I began sprinting away from this crazy man. Stop! We're gonna give you a ride! Stop running away from us! I looked back and we had a fair distance between us. Now that I got a closer look, he was somewhat chubby and probably had not been expecting me to be able to run so fast, since I was slightly overweight myself. I turned onto the road and continued sprinting until I heard a car squealing down the road behind me. I looked back to see a single headlight in the distance, speeding down the road, and the man chasing after me starting to gain on me. I started freaking out. I ran and turned another left, making a break for the park, since the area of the park I was running towards was dark and thick with trees. I figured I could lose them. As I ran into the park, struggling to continue sprinting, I was losing my breath. I looked back to see the car turn down the road. The driver stopped in place and yelled at his friend. Hey man, get back in the car. The cops hang out back there. They might see us. Leave him. We're getting out of there. The man chasing me stopped immediately and ran back towards the car. He flung the door open and jumped in. As soon as he slammed it closed, the driver did a pinpoint U-turn and sped off right onto the road up ahead. Then they disappeared. The park was extremely large. I remember my parents talking about a good number of drug deals taking place there and that the police were starting to send officers to patrol the area at night to bust up any drug deals they witnessed. That must have been what spooked my pursuers away. I jogged quickly into the park and hid in the darkness beneath the trees for about 20 minutes or so, just to be sure they were definitely gone. I tried to calm myself down as much as I could after. I walked through the park towards the exit and to my community. My senses were on hyper alert. For all I knew, there could have been some other weirdo lurking around in the dark just waiting for me. Thankfully, I made it to my house just fine. I quickly unlocked the door. I walked into the living room to my dog greeting me. I looked to my right to see my mom, of course, passed out on the couch, with the TV still on just as I'd thought. I walked into my own room and flopped onto my bed, exhausted both physically and emotionally. I was relieved I had gotten away from those two guys. I had never been happier to be in the safety of my own home. I always knew it was dangerous to walk alone at night. Usually, I don't. I had hoped that the one time I did, it would be okay. Clearly, I had been proven wrong. I woke up around noon the next day and walked into the living room to say hello to my parents. Now, my mom got up and hugged me, apologizing profusely for falling asleep when she said she'd pick me up. She said she had woken up around 5 in the morning and freaked out that she'd fallen asleep, that something bad might have happened to me. She rushed into my room to see me sound asleep and was really relieved that I had gotten home safely. I didn't say anything about what happened on my walk home that night. I knew it would devastate my parents to hear they'd almost lost their son. My mom would have never been able to live with the guilt. 
she could have prevented the whole encounter just by staying awake to come pick me up. I didn't really blame her though. I never actually told anyone except for a close friend of mine about this experience. I have no idea why those guys singled me out like that, but I knew for a fact they were up to no good. I don't think I ever want to find out what they were up to. I'm glad I'm safe and sound. Cody, Wyoming, Midnight I just finished a very long day at work. I'm a medical courier, and I'm regularly on the road staying in hotels. Life is never dull. This particular evening, I wound up in a 500-mile drive that ended in Cody, Wyoming. Like I said, it was around midnight. It was very cold. It was in December, after all, and this was Wyoming. The roads had been very so-so that night. They weren't clear, but they weren't as treacherous as usual. It was one of those drives in the dark where you're on edge the whole time. Staying alert for 500 miles on dark roads that were nearly abandoned, especially at this time of night, with light snow and heavy winds, it really takes a lot out of a person. This particular week had been very busy too. I had been to four different states that week by the time I reached Wyoming that evening. The drive to the patient's house was up a windy, slick road. Luckily, it was fairly uneventful. After I had dropped off the medicine to them, I called my boss to let them know I'd made the delivery successfully and was heading to a hotel to get some sleep. It was the usual conversation. We talked briefly about how much they would reimburse me for the hotel room. They always say 80 to to $100. It's pretty typical and fair, since a cheap hotel in Cody, Wyoming is about that price. I'm 31 though, so a good night's rest, a good free breakfast, and a nice AM soak in the hot tub are requirements for me whenever I catch myself in a hotel room away from home. I mean, by the time I got to the hotel, I'd have put some pretty damn serious miles on there, so I decided to treat myself. If I'm staying in a hotel, it has to be a good one. I can afford to treat myself just a little bit after such hard work. I feel a lot better after a good night's rest, a great breakfast, and a nice soak. I won't name the chain of hotels I stay at, but I usually frequent one chain because it's the best value in my hometown, which is back in Nebraska. This night, I pulled into the hotel, which I had stayed at four times now, so I was quite familiar with the place. I had called ahead about eight hours before when I was leaving Denver to book a room for myself, and let them know they would be expecting me at midnight. I walked in with my bag, dusting off the snow that had fallen on me while I was getting my stuff out of the car. It was very quiet inside. There was no music, and the TV wasn't on in the lobby either. I wandered to the counter, leaving a trail of wet shoe prints behind me from coming in out of the snow. My shoes were squeaking as I approached, but when I got to the counter, there was no one there. On the counter was a bowl of ice cream with a brownie from a restaurant connected to the hotel. The local paper was open to the comics page, and the Sudoku was half filled out with the pen still there. Hanging on the back of the chair was a small lady's coat with a fake fur fringe around the hood. On the floor next to the chairs were a pair of smaller pink and black Nikes and a black purse as well. I figured by the assumption of the coat, shoes, and purse that whoever was supposed to man the desk must have been in the bathroom. I stood at the counter quietly waiting on her to return. I fiddled with my wallet a bit, getting out my card to pay for everything. I scrolled down through my phone and hooked up to the free Wi-Fi. Five minutes go by, then ten, then fifteen. The phone started ringing. I had no idea where she could be. I had begun to get irritated. It had been a long day and I wanted to get rested before I had to get up and drive home in the morning. After the phone stopped ringing, I began to wander around the lobby and behind the counter. Hello? Is anyone there? I shouted as loudly as possible. The area further behind the counter was an employee's only area. I ventured back there where a hallway led to the back of the house area. 
connected to the office's staff elevator, bathrooms, laundry, and the restaurant. I ventured down this hallway, still calling out. No one answered. It was now 12.30. As I returned to the counter and began looking for a posted phone number for a manager or someone of authority to report this strange going on, the phone rang again. The cordless phone was laying next to the paper the person manning the desk had opened. Frustrated and exhausted, I answered the phone, hoping it was someone who could tell me where the woman is who was supposed to be checking me in. It wasn't. It was another guest who had tried calling in multiple times for a wake-up call in the morning. I explained to the gentleman on the phone my situation and how I couldn't help him. He stated he was coming down as well. We were going to look for the girl who was supposed to man the counter together. I had not found a number to call for a manager. Five minutes went by and an older man with some odd glasses and long unkempt hair came into the lobby from the first floor hallway. At this point, I had been behind the counter for a fair bit and had been shouting to the point I feared I may wake everyone up. I had wandered through the back area, the lobby, the front part of the restaurant, all while shouting. There was no one there. This guy who had just appeared was kind of giving me the creeps. I was exhausted and on high alert. The employee was missing and this creepy looking guy had just happened to appear at the same time. Feeling a bit nervous about this gentleman, I stayed prepared for any strange behavior and kept myself at least an arm's distance from him. I explained where I had looked. I began to go through what I called the worst case scenario preparation. This looked like a guy who could have easily overpowered a small woman. I may be standing here with a crazy person. I kept my space and my back towards the main entry just in case. I had no reason to believe I was in immediate trouble, but something about the way this guy was looking at me and the area was really freaking me out. It was at this point I debated on calling the cops. It was now 12.45 a.m. The gentleman told me that maybe she was in the bathroom. I responded that I had thought that myself, but I'd walked by and called out to see if she needed help, and nobody answered. He insisted that we go check the women's bathrooms ourselves. A red flag went off immediately. I put another foot or two of space between us as I let him lead us down the hallway to the employee bathroom. My heart and mind were racing. Did this guy kill her or something? Was he leading me back here to try and kill me too? I started to worry about my safety. As we went down the hallway that led to small rooms with one exit in and out, we reached the bathroom. He knocks and announces himself, then forces his way inside. Bathroom was empty. We checked a few more rooms and the elevator, but we didn't find anyone. We ventured back to the lobby, where I still tried to look for any phone number that could be a manager or a supervisor. After another 10 minutes, I finally found it. Someone answered. It was now 12.55 a.m., the half-asleep voice on the other end of the phone was the maintenance woman for the hotel, confused as to who I am and why I was calling her. I explained the situation as the creepy man stood on the other side of the counter, now giving me a cold glare. The maintenance woman said she would be there in 10 minutes or so. I hung up the phone and walked around, still confused. The woman who was supposed to be there had just left all her stuff, as if she'd vanished altogether. It was at this point I decided to wander towards the lobby and the seating area for the restaurant. Once in the door, I turned the corner. I noticed something I hadn't noticed before. Down at the end of the booths, there were a pair of legs just barely hanging out of one of them. I had walked within 15 feet of there while checking around before the creepy guy had showed up. Although I hadn't noticed before, I could now clearly see legs hanging out. Instantly, the pit of my stomach turned sour and a sense of dread came over me. The creepy guy got right up by me. Thinking the worst, I took a few steps away from him and down the row of booths. I was in this dark restaurant with him at the other end. I cautiously approached the booth where the woman was laying. She was about 20 years old and very pretty. I tapped her foot, but she didn't respond. I shook her again, trying to get her attention. No response. At this moment, the creepy guy started to walk down towards me. 
I started to feel I may need to defend myself. I knelt down to draw from my ankle holster as the man began to quickly move towards me. It was at this exact moment that the girl decided to wake up and kick me in the chest, knocking me down and stopping the creepy man in his tracks. Apparently, she had been really deeply asleep. Mr. Creepy Guy was just a guest. Sorry, man. Moments later, the maintenance woman arrived, and by 1.15am, I was in my room trying to decompress from that stressful-ass experience. I really thought I was alone in there with a killer or something. I've never spoken on this, not even to my parents or anyone around me. I'm a 22-year-old male, and this happened when I was 14, all the way through the age of 15. My friends and I would always hang out at the local mall during our free time. One day, I had arrived a bit earlier than my friends, and was waiting at a seating area in the food court. There were a couple of couches around each other, and it was a common area for anyone to come and sit. I didn't really notice much when a man came over and sat down at a couch across from me. I was sitting on my phone, not paying attention, until he spoke up and said something along the lines of, Do you come here often? I looked up to see a man who was in his late 50s to early 60s. I told him I often did with my friends, and he then introduced himself. I still remember his first name, as it was exactly the same as my dad's. I didn't get any initial weird feelings. The man seemed normal enough, and I had no reason to be weirded out by him. I told him my name, and we started making small talk. I'm a fairly sociable person, and have been since a young age, so I was fine with talking to what I assumed was just a kind older man wanting to chat with someone. He started asking me about the things I like to do. I said I enjoyed going to the local lake and fishing and swimming, to which he said he went out to the same area every weekend and enjoyed the same things as well. I said I enjoyed making music. He said he liked making music also. I told him I was an avid piano player, and he excitingly told me he had a piano at his house. As I started to say more things, to each and every one he replied he enjoyed doing them also. It felt normal at first, but as we kept talking I kept getting a weirder and weirder feeling. It was like every single thing he said was trying to prove something to me and win me over. He said he had a boat at the lake and we should go sometime together. He even said he lived right across the street from the mall and that I was welcome to stop by and play his piano. Even going as far as to tell me the complex he lived in and how to get there from the mall. He said if I'd like to go over that same day and play his piano, I was more than welcome to. With every passing minute, he was pressing harder and harder for me to come hang out with him. Talking with him honestly started to give me the weirdest primitive instinct feeling ever, like I was staring at the face of evil or bad intentions. After five to ten minutes of talking with him, I lied and said my friends had now arrived, and I was going to go find them. He somewhat sadly said okay and wished me well. A couple of weeks go by, and my friends and I go to the mall once again. We were all walking through, when out of the corner of my eye, I see the exact same man. He had his hoodie pulled down covering his face and was walking past us in the opposite direction. We locked eyes for a split second, and my heart immediately dropped. I didn't look back though, and honestly forgot about it soon after. For the next two months or so though, I would keep seeing him randomly appearing at the mall. I kept brushing it off as a coincidence. There are definitely regulars there who come very often. I really didn't think too much of seeing him, as he'd never tried to approach me since the first day. Occasionally though, I'd look over and see him, and he'd be staring at me. I was very naive. I always got a semi-weird feeling anytime I saw him, but I always just brushed it off. That was until one day. I went to the mall with my friends like usual, and we hung out for a few hours before all leaving and going home our separate ways. I got home and went into my room, 
No one else was home with me, and I would be by myself for a couple of hours. My mom gets home around 7 to 8 p.m. and comes into my room looking somewhat worried, asking if I'd noticed a man outside. I said no, and she then showed me her phone. We have two cameras, one in the front of the house and one in the back. About 20 minutes after I'd gotten home, someone sneakily approached our house. We lived off a very busy street, and our front wall blocks a majority of the view in. We did not see a car park or anything, just a random man walking up to our house from the street. The camera was located near our front door looking out to the driveway, so as the man got closer, I realized it was the same guy I had been seeing at the mall. I immediately felt sick to my stomach. He came and looked through the front door glass. He walked over to the side of our house near our driveway and left the view of the camera. I remember there was nothing on the back camera either, so he must have stayed by the side of our house for quite a while. My room was not located over there, so I have no idea what he could have been doing. He then came back around after a while and looked through the front door again before walking away. I don't know if I was just too embarrassed or scared to say anything, but I said I didn't notice and didn't even know who it was. My mom found it weird he was looking into our house, but said it could have been a homeless guy or a druggie. We did luff off a busy street with a bus stop right in front of our house. I just went with that. My dad added more security cameras after this to deter people, and I never admitted to seeing him before. After he showed up to my house though, it was confirmed to me that he was following me around. I don't know what his intentions were, but he never came back to the house. We moved to a different part of the city not long after, and it was too far to go to that mall again. I've not seen him ever since, and I wish to never do so again. To the best of my memory, it was the late 80s, on a hot and sunny day in Toronto, Canada. I was about 12 years old. My friends and I were playing baseball at a public school baseball diamond, which was on a relatively busy street. Just for reference, this school has since been demolished, and a new school building was built right over said baseball diamond. A new building with the exact same name. Also, interesting random fact, the old school building happens to be the location where country singer Michelle Wright did her music video for All I Really Wanna Do. Now, back to the story. A man in his 40s walked up and sat on the bench right beside the baseball diamond, right underneath the hot sun. No hat, nor any other kind of shade. We thought this was a little bit odd, but we kept playing anyway. He was watching us and would shout some comments pertaining to baseball here and there. I suppose he was quite bored and had nothing better to do. Let's call him man number one. The baseball diamond was right beside the busy street, which had its share of poor people, middle class people, drug addicts, drug dealers, prostitutes, and other weirdos. Needless to say, we were pretty used to random stuff going on around us. As the man kept shouting though, his uninvited baseball comments began to really annoy me. At this point, I qualified him as creepy. To my relief, he eventually walked away. Soon, it was my turn to pitch. Just then, another man showed up, also in his 40s. Let's call him man number two. Number two also had some comments on our baseball game. He was much more aggressive in his advice, though. Eventually, he came closer and closer until he stepped right up to me and started giving me pitching advice. I thought it was strange that he was so enthusiastic about this, but as a naive young boy, I had the habit of respecting and obeying adults by default. He started getting right up against my path and holding my wrists to show me how to pitch. You know, how you see in the movies. How the guy puts moves on the girls under the guise of teaching them something, like throwing a ball or swinging a golf club. Yeah, he was doing that to me. Now that I think about it, he was right up against my body too. It was quite inappropriate to say the least. 
I was starting to get very uncomfortable. What made it even worse is I could smell the alcohol lingering on him as he was touching me inappropriately in front of all my friends in broad daylight. I didn't know what to do. I don't know what my friends were thinking, but I remember it being very quiet. I suppose they were in a bit of shock as well. Not as much as I was, though. I think it's just a thing kids have to please people, especially adults. Kind of reminds me of that movie The Lovely Bones, where the predator uses kids' respect for adults against them, manipulating them. When I finally came over my initial shock, I backed away. Just then, I heard man number one shouting some obscenities at man number two. Man number one had returned. He came right at the other guy and started shoving him around. Man number two started to back away, cursing back at man number one, who was still scolding and cursing at him as well. He did some sort of flying kick into his back and sent him stumbling forward. This continued as their now fight moved out of the schoolyard. We watched them for a few minutes until man number two relented and disappeared. Man number one returned looking quite angry and shouted a few things to us. To be honest, I was still in shock and didn't understand what he was saying though. Finally, he walked away for good this time. Even though I was a little scrapper kid, for years thinking back on it, I felt foolish, violated, ashamed for letting someone put his hands on me like that. I realized later on that I must be grateful to that stranger, man number one, who had nothing better to do that day than sit in the sun shouting uninvited baseball comments at kids, but returned anyway to beat up and chase away a sexual predator trying to prey on a child. Whoever you are, I thank you. And to everyone else, please let kids know they aren't obligated to please or be polite to anyone that makes them feel uncomfortable in any way. They don't owe them anything. Encourage them to be strong and stand up for themselves.